Well, I praise God for the privilege to be at CCDA. This feels almost like a huge family reunion. And uh, we get a chance to be with those of us who have been called to the same kind of ministry, to love God in a similar kind of way. We get called to pursue the kingdom of God with passion. And this is a place that fuels our fire. And so for me, it's an honor to have it in Chicago, Illinois, my hometown. And uh, amen. And it's an honor very much to had this opportunity to look back over Dr. Perkins' life and Dr. Vera May's life and all that they've given, the history of CCDA over the past 20 years, and to remember where we've come from as we look toward our next uh, season of growth and development as a movement. And so tonight, um, as I have this opportunity to share with you, I want to do something that will appear at first glance a little bit radical. Uh, and I know, I'm, I'm kind of known for doing things every now and then that's a little radical. So first, let me give some disclaimers, all right? Uh, well, disclaimers. One is, um, I am going to use a text that I know is really spoken to individuals, but I want to think of it for us as a community of people together. So that's the first thing I want to say. So in a moment, I'm going to read a text. And uh, because my, my mentor has already told me he loves scripture, and John Perkins would say he discovered me when I was in New Jersey and didn't know how to read the Bible for myself. John would say that he found me and helped me move from Pentecostalism. Uh, I think he said I was caught between Pentecostalism and, and Baptist, and that's about right. I was leaning heavily toward Pentecostal and still am, so if I get, if I get moved tonight, you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> uh, but I know that Scripture matters to us as a movement, and I want to make sure that I always use it well. And, uh, and then I want to say that one of the things that John has really impacted me about was how well we exposit scripture. So I hope you're taking advantage of the expositions in the morning, but I want to really always honor the word of God in our midst. Uh, for me, and I don't know, I've said this before and I'll say it again, for me, the very first time that, that John Perkins' influence really got pressed into the fabric of my life was when I was a, a seminary student at Fuller Seminary. And he was asked to come to a Bible study on John chapter 4. And for me, anybody who knows me well will know that John chapter 4 is really the, the, the text that has shaped my theology, my hermeneutic, my approach to ministry. The book that I've written uh, is called A Credible Witness and is totally based on John chapter 4. My first time hearing anybody do that text, a social, political, biblical uh, justice was the first time I heard you teach it at Fuller Seminary. And I've lived in that text for 20 years since, and it has shaped my thinking and my approach to ministry, and I thank you for that. And so afterwards, I'm going to be outside with that book and, and some others just because I'd like to greet you personally, because I believe this, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And it's going to take faith for us to do what it is God's calling us to do. It's not going to be an easy thing for us to accomplish all by ourselves. It's going to take the power of God, the presence of God. It's going to take God's coming in and doing through us what we as human beings can't do by ourselves. And so I believe that it means more than coming to a conference. I believe it's more than coming and celebrating 20 years. I think when we leave here, we've got to leave here with ways that we can keep re-engaging what we hear at this conference so that we can keep reminding ourselves of that which is fuels and ignites our passion for the call to reconciliation and urban transformation. Amen? So with those things being said and the disclaimer being given, I want to talk tonight from the book of Jeremiah. I told you that I know for sure that this text is written to an individual, but tonight I'd like us to think about it as a community of faith together. I want to read one verse of scripture, and then I'd like to pray with you and see where God takes us tonight as we share from Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5 says this, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Before you were formed in the womb, I knew you. Before you were even born, I set you apart. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. This is the word of the Lord, and we're thankful. 
Tonight, I want us to remember who we are. If I had to give us a theme to hang our hearts on together, it would simply be the challenge to remember who we are. And because I've already said that we can't do this by ourselves and in our own strength, I want to ask God to meet us tonight to free me from whatever I need to be freed from so that I can pour my heart out for you so that God can show up here tonight in this great auditorium and speak a word that comes from God's heart. So let's pray together. It's not by might nor by power, but by your spirit, says the Lord. I believe that, God. We believe that it is not our human strength or our capacity to make things change that has caused the 20 years that we have celebrated tonight to be the reality that we know of. It's been by your grace and by your power, God, the testimony that we heard tonight. That's been the faithfulness of God as you minister through that precious husband and wife and that couple who have raised four children for your glory and who are leading a church, Lord God, around the world that is a testament to the kingdom of God. It is not, Lord God, because we were so wonderful or willful that we were able to pull this off. This is because you use human beings to accomplish your great purpose. So tonight, God, we pray that you would speak to us in this auditorium, that you would help us to remember who we are and who you've called us to be. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. We've come not just to celebrate or to gather or to network. We've come to get our marching orders from you. We've come to hear what you would have us do and what the next 20 years are supposed to look like. So speak to us, we pray, for we are listening, Lord God. We want to hear exactly what you would say to us this night for the edification of your church, for the glory of your own name, for the coming of your kingdom. Speak, Lord, for we're asking you to do it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Now, truth is something that can be found in all kinds of unusual places. I've already told you that I understand this text of Jeremiah is a text that's spoken to one young boy who's being told at a very young age, before you were formed in the womb, I had plans for you. Before I created you and before I fashioned you, I knew exactly what my purpose was for you. And so as I was thinking about this whole notion of being bor born with purpose and being born with destiny, and design written into the very fabric of who we are, I began thinking about the fact that is that just true of individuals or could that be true of communities that God calls into being? Could it also be true that not only are the individuals that God breathes life into those people who have purpose and destiny written into their DNA, could it be that institutions and organizations and communities of faith like CCDA, could it be also true that we too have been called and purpose and seen before we even knew the reality of people gathered in a room. Could it be that God had purpose for us before there was a CCDA and before we did gather in hotels? Could it be that God knows what God intends for CCDA and that we have got to think again about what did God have in mind? Not when John Perkins started CCDA, not when John Perkins gathered people, but when God envisioned CCDA, what was God thinking and what was God intending? ending. Now, as I thought about that, I was also doing some reflecting about my own life. My husband and my children and I took a vacation so that we could kind of unhook from some things that were going on in our very, very busy lives, and we could kind of get away, relax, vacation, recreate, so that we could get fresh in our own hearts and our spirits again. And we took a trip together as a family. We went away on a cruise by God's grace and God's mercy, and uh, we had this absolute wonderful time where there were no phones, no cell phones, no internet connection. We were out at sea and we were literally able to unhook and for those of us who work as hard as we do in the ministries that we've been called to every now and then we need to come to the conclusion that a Sabbath is not something that is somehow a luxury but maybe just a necessity for us to have longevity in ministry amen just thought I'd add that one in 
And so, because I have to be helped to have a Sabbath, I almost have to get away from where I usually am so that I can engage God in a way that I can connect. Well, my kids thought this was fabulous. And so as we took this cruise, we happened to be on a Disney cruise because they said that your kids will have a wonderful time and the parents will have a great time too. So we decided to give it a shot. So for one week, we went away on this cruise. Now I can tell you this, they show every single Disney movie that they have ever shown in their whole life. If you have missed a Disney movie, believe me, in one week, they will show you every movie that Disney has ever made, every mermaid, every pirate, every, uh, every princess you're gonna see while you're on that cruise. They're gonna make sure that you are reminded about what Disney has made. But one day, when my kids were in the pool and they were frolicking and doing their thing, I was on the second deck and I was watching the Jumbotron screen in front of me as my kids were playing. I'm watching the screen and a movie is on. It was The Lion King. Now, I did not expect God to meet me on the second deck of the cruise ship watching The Lion King. Now, I told you already, I've given some disclaimers. I didn't know you could find preaching in The Lion King. I just didn't know it. I wasn't expecting it. I wasn't looking for it. But as I stood on the second deck, my kids just frolicking and splashing away. I'm on the second deck having an experience with God. Tears are starting to well up in my eyes as I'm seeing God talk to me in a movie. I wasn't ready for it. I wasn't ready for it. When my kids saw the look on my face and they finally tiled off and came up, I said, God is speaking in this movie. And my kids said, Ma, you see preaching in everything. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and I said, no, no, I'm serious. I'm telling you, God is talking through this movie. Now, I know that it is hard to convince folk that God can preach in a cartoon. So I thought I would show you what I saw that night when I, I was minding my own business when all of a sudden God broke into my reality and told me to remember who I am. Just look at the screens. You'll see what I'm talking about. In West Africa, there is a question that I became acquainted with. It's a question that is a prophetic question. It's a question of purpose and destiny. It's a question that asks people to think about their origin. And so when people want to know who you are and what you're about, the question that you're asked is, what called you forth? What called you forth? The thinking behind the question is that people don't show up on the planet for nothing that if God creates someone or something, God creates that purpose or that thing, that person or that thing with purpose, that it's God's intention that the earth needed your presence. Like Simba or Jeremiah, God holds our destiny and then brings us forth, shapes us and presents us to the world that's waiting for us. And so in West Africa, their theology is that something demanded your presence on earth. There was a need for a CCDA in the earth. And so what made this happen? What called you forth? What brought you into being? Now, sometimes, to answer that question, one has to couple that question with the West African concept that many of us have heard about, which is Sankofa. Sometimes, to know what brought you here, one has to look back to move forward. That before we can take our steps into destiny with clarity, we might have to look back to see where has God brought us from? What has God done through us? What was the origins of us showing up on the planet? Why did God create an institution or an organization to serve the urban poor? What made this happen? And what do we have to remember about our beginnings before we take flight toward our future? Sankofa. It is always a wise thing to look back before you move forward. It is always wise to remember who you are, to remember what brought you forth, and to regularly revisit that before you try to step toward destiny. 
And so as I think about this Lion King, the whole earth was waiting on him to show up. You remember the opening scene where all of the animal kingdom is gathered around Pride Rock in anticipation of this new Lion King that's going to be presented to the whole community. I want to suggest to you that we as individuals were also being waited on. There was something about us showing up on the planet that God needed and not just us as individuals. I want to suggest that God needed a CCDA in the earth and that whether we know it or not, the world was waiting for an urban, biblically based group of believers who would take on the life of Christ and incarnate him in a way that was believable. Somebody, something was perched waiting for us to show up and we get born. We become, people see us, we become what God intended and there is celebration and there is joy. Now something interesting about this birth is that we grow, don't we? And CCDA has grown. There are new faces in this room that wasn't here at the beginning of CCDA. Oh, this is a whole new crowd now, Dr. Perkins. This is a whole new group of young'uns who weren't there in the beginning. Amen. They didn't see the struggle and they weren't there during the beatings. All we know is that we are now this wonderful, mighty army of people who are being mobilized to make transformation happen in cities all across the country and around the world. We like this part. Amen. This is where we get to saying, I just can't wait to be king. It's, you know, we're like, I'm ready. I want to lead, I want to change something, I want to do something great. I just can't wait to be king. But before we sing that song too quickly, the lessons I began to see that day that I was standing on that cruise ship looking on the second deck at that jumbotron screen, I began thinking so often in our zeal for change and transformation, we think that when we get in power, when we get a chance to be the leaders, we're going to really make a difference. I can't wait to be king or queen. I really wish it's our turn to lead this organization. I really wish it's our turn to lead the church forward. We got better answers and we got better systems and we got better models. And I wish they would let us bring ourselves to the party. And there's room and space for that. But life has a way of humbling us, does it not? Life has a way of, of throwing curveballs and, and, and taking us off our game. Unexpected things happen that we can't anticipate. And that's exactly what happened to Simba. Something so devastating, something so tragic, something so unexpected, something un so unforeseen took place in young Simba's life who had known the nurture of a father, the tutoring of a father, the mentoring of a father, the nurture and care and love of a father has his father radically snatched away from him and he loses his, his bearings in life. Life has a way of switching our song from I just can't wait to be king to Akuna Matata. We can be looking for our chance for leadership and within a short period of time we can find ourselves on the backside of a desert not wanting anybody or anything to ask us to be responsible for nobody or nothing. We've had it, we're done. We feel like there's nothing more we can give. We made some mistakes. We, 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 we didn't balance the budget. We, we squandered the grant. Something went wrong. We had a moral failing. And whatever the case might be, people who promised to be there aren't there. The vision we had, we thought when we got to be in charge, it was going to happen. We find out that it's harder than we thought it was going to be. And we find ourselves wanting to run away from responsibility and run away from the destiny that God had written into the very fabric of who we are as people and as a collective group called CCDA. I'm telling you, we can want one thing, but things can shift in the social, political, spiritual lives that we find ourselves in that we can say, I don't want to have anything to do with it anymore, and we want to run the opposite direction. That's exactly what Simba does. He runs the opposite direction. He decides that there's nothing. He wants to be bothered with leadership at all, and so he finds himself with a new set of friends who have very low expectations of him. 
They're not expecting him to lead anything. They're not actually asking him to be morally responsible. They're not asking him to demonstrate any type of character. They just want him to chill. Just hang and be with us and be like us. Akuna Matata, there's no worries for the rest of our days. This is a problem free philosophy. Makuna Matata, no responsibility at all. And so for those of us who have found ourselves in a movement that has already begun and it's already growing and we're no longer at the fledgling stage and we're so excited to be a part of CCDA, I want us to be very, very careful to have a Sankofa and to turn our heads back before we try to fly forward and ask ourselves, how on earth did the people who start this movement, how did they stay faithful and how did they avoid the Akuna Matata syndrome? How did they keep from running toward irresponsibility? How did they keep their own moral and personal failures and shortcomings from taking, taking them out of the race to become who we are today? How did they do that? What was it that anchored them to the vision of God in the first place? You see, Simba needed someone to help him remember who he was. Simba needed to be reminded that he was born with purpose and design. Simba needed somebody to come and catch him and bring him back to his senses and bring him back to the vision of the beginning. He needed help to Sankofa because sometimes we can want to look back, but we don't have the strength to look back. And we find ourselves with people who have helped us to compromise so long that we don't even know how to do it without a friend who comes and finds us. This is why these conferences are so important for us to have, because we get the opportunity for prophetic friends to show up and to challenge us to look back so we can move forward. Rafiki is a real friend. Rafiki is the friend that'll hit you hard even when you know it's gonna hurt, but it's gonna be for your good. Rafiki shows up in Simba's life when he least expects it. He's pursuing irresponsibility. He's pursuing a life where nothing's demanded of him. He's not exercising leadership. He's not trying to engage culture or change his world. He's running from that, and Rafiki goes and finds him. And Rafiki comes as a prophetic presence with a stick in his hand, and he comes and he says kind of annoyingly, you know, so much so that Simba has to say first, who are you? And Rafiki says, that's not the real question, is it? The question is not who am I, the question is who are, CCD, who are you? Who are you? Rafiki said, it's a real problem when you don't know who you are. It's a real problem when you're hanging out and you can't say that you know, that you know, that you know what your identity is and how you, why you exist and, and, and for what you exist. You don't even know who you are. But Rafiki says, I know you. I know who you are. Now, I expected him to say, you're Simba, but he doesn't. He says, you're Mufasa's boy. I want to say to you that the first father of this movement is not John Perkins. The first father of this movement is God. God birthed CCDA. God put the vision for CCDA into the heart of human beings. And there were faithful people who carried that vision and gave it birth. And so I can say this to all of us. When people see us doing the work that we're doing, it's supposed to glorify God so that others see our good works and they glorify God in heaven. They're supposed to say, I know who you are. Oh, I see how you serve the poor and I see how you feed the hungry. I see how you sacrifice and how you reconcile. I see how you cross the gender gap and I see how you serve and how you're indigenously raising up people and I see how you get out of the way and let the people who live there take it over. I know who you are. You're God's child. You're a product of the kingdom of God. Oh, we see this. We've seen other people come in and they ride on our backs. They use us for their own political purposes or for their own social agenda. But not you, CCDA. I know who you are. You're God's child. You came out of God's heart. This looks like the Bible to me. You're God's child. And then Simba says, oh, I'm sorry to tell you, like my dad is 
dead. And I know we would never say that God is dead. I know we believe in the God of the resurrection and I know we would never say that God is dead. But sometimes we might get so actively involved and so, so, so humanly motivated that we could act as if God is not a spirit who is active in human affairs. We might act by the way we pray or don't pray, the way we ask the spirit of God to speak or don't speak, the way we expect God to show up and transform lives or not. We might act like though we say God is alive, we act like he's dead. Amen. And that's why I love growing up in the Pentecostal tradition that I did. They used to sing a song that I believe is still true today. They would clap their hands and stomp their feet. And they would say, God's not dead. He's still alive. God's not dead. He's still alive. God's not dead. He's still alive because I feel him. I feel him in my hands and I feel him in my feet. I feel God all around me. I can tell God's not dead because I see people being transformed every day. I can tell you that God's not dead because I see communities being changed by the power of a living God. God's not dead because he's still speaking to people. It didn't just happen in the old days. Miracles are happening today and I'm a witness that he's still alive. And every now and then Rafiki has got to help those of us who are the children of God believe that God's still able to speak to us today. That somehow this is not some ancient fairy tale that we read, but God is still breathing life into human beings today. And so he said, correction, not knew your father, but know your father, present tense, he's still alive. And I'll show him to you. Would to God that we had more people who could show us the Father. Would to God we had more people who could take us to him. Would to God that we could have a revival meeting that God could show up at a Sheridan hotel and the people who do God's work could feel God's presence in a hotel. Oh, would to God somebody could show it to him. Rafiki said, follow me, I'll show you him. And in order to get through all of the debris that keeps us from seeing God and experiencing God and hearing God and watching God do stuff in active ways, more than a theoretical God, but a practical, applicable, touching, tangible God, how on earth does that happen? Rafiki said, follow me. You're going to have to get some debris out of the way. Some of your theology might have to be moved out the way. Uh, some of your personal experience might have to be moved out. Oh, get the debris out the way so you can see God. Ah, God, he'll lead you beside still waters. He'll restore your soul. He said, follow me. And that's exactly what Simba does. And he gets to the pool of reflection, the place where he can look in, the place where he can re-encounter God again and see the Father again and hear the Father again. He hasn't heard the voice of his Father in such a long time. He needs desperately a word from God. Ah, so he looks in and at first glance he doesn't see anything and I want to be the Rafiki at CCDA tonight and say look harder. If you don't see him the first time, look harder. If you don't hear God speak the first time, ah! Look harder. And this time, Simba really does look. He really does take it seriously. And all of a sudden, a vision appears, and he hears God show up. When's the last time you had the voice of God speak? And sometimes when God speaks, we're shocked and surprised by what God has to say. God says, or Mufasa says to Simba, you've forgotten me. And I know like Simba, all of us would protest and say, never. I could never forget you. I love you. And this is what Mufasa says. You've forgotten who you are. And in so doing, you've forgotten me. You see, the greatest act of worship is not whether we raise our hands or whether or not we speak in tongues or kneel down in silent reverence. The greatest act of worship is to become who God says we are. That's how we give God glory, is to become what God envisioned before we were formed, to become who God says we are, to become the who we were intended to be. That gives God glory. That's worship. 
And then he said, Simba, you've forgotten me. But I'm here to remind you that you're more than what you've become. As I stood on that deck and I watched that film, I began to think about those of us like Simba who have lost our way, who had high hopes when we began the ministry, who really wanted to do great things like we've read about and let justice roll down. And I said to myself, Lord God, how do we get ourselves back on track? How do we begin to find our way back to the people who are needing us and waiting for us? How do we live, leave this Akuna Matata place that we found ourselves that is self-serving? And how do we get back in the game? After we look harder and you hear our voice, the next, we hear your voice, the next thing I realized was we'll have to do what Simba did. We're gonna to have to fight our way. Sometimes there are things that we know are hindering us those are the scars who are waiting for us to say, you're just a fledgling ministry, you don't have enough economic support, you're working with poor people who can't support the ministry themselves. All of the things we hear that keep us from believing it's possible. You're a white guy, what makes you think you can work in a multiracial context? You're just a woman, what makes you think you ought to lead it? All of the things that we hear from the denominations and the places that speak ill of us, all the scars are waiting to tell us we can't do it. There's somebody back there who we're gonna have to put up our sanctified dukes and just decide I'm gonna become who I'm gonna become who God says I am if I gotta fight my way to my destiny if I gotta stand up to you and all the naysayers if I gotta stand against the denomination and just tell them God called a woman and I'm just gonna have to do it anyhow I may not have enough money, and you might be right, I'm broke, but I'm still going to do what God told me. So come on, let's fight this thing, because I'm moving toward what God said I'm supposed to do. I'm going for it. I'm going to stand up to every fear I've got, and I'm moving forward because it's not about me. It's not about what I like and it's not about my comfort anymore. A world is waiting on CCDA. A world is waiting for us to show up and take our rightful place in the circle of life. There are people all around the world who are waiting for what we do and what we know. There are folks who are looking for partnerships where people from wealth and people from poverty co collaborate together to create a new community called the kingdom of God. Some people don't believe it's possible and we know it can be so. And they're looking for us to show us what it looks like. They're waiting for us to show up. And so as I get ready to, to land this plane and as I get ready to bring us to a place of what we should remember as we Sankofa, Simba had to remember that it wasn't about him, that he, he needed to get back because the whole pride was waiting for him. It wasn't about his personal success or his personal comfort. There was a whole group of people who were being devastated because he was out of line for his leadership. What I would challenge us to remember is this. I said that the first father of this movement is God. CCDA started in the heart of God. I wanna suggest though that the father of this movement that God gave this concept to, that God breathed three R's into, is Reverend Dr. John Perkins. And so to honor him for 20 years of service and 20 years of what God has done through CCDA, and I'm now talking to those of us who are the youngins, we need to remember what this movement was founded on. You ready? The first thing it was founded on was suffering. The reason why we know John Perkins and Vera Mae Perkins today is because they suffered their way into leadership. They did not just jump on the national and international scene and say, I think we'll be reconcilers. That wasn't the vision. When nobody knew who they were in Mississippi, when nobody knew who they were, they were just toiling and doing what they believed God called them to do. This man got beat within an inch of his life, almost to death. He suffered so that he could become the leader of a movement called CCDA. And we got a generation of folks who don't want to suffer for success. We want success, we just want to skip the suffering part. Amen. That's why we like that song, I just can't wait to be king, because we don't know you get beat to death before you become. All right. All right. All right. And so do remember that movements like CCDA, they don't get built on the backs of just those of us who think we know it all. 
They come out of a crucible of suffering. They come out of people who understand that you're going to cry sometime. It comes out of people who just won't quit even when all the odds are stacked against them. Suffering, raising children on little to no money, finding a way to farm and, and, and to make ends meet when ain't nobody looking, when there is not a room filled with hotel folks. All by myself in a hospital room, I'm still not going to hate nobody. Remember who you are. Remember that you are a movement that was founded on suffering. And that if we're going to be countercultural, we're going to have to be people who don't always seek the way of comfort. And people who don't fudge our numbers and fudge our values to get the grant. Suffering. The second thing, as we remember who we are, as we Sankofa, remember that we were born not just out of suffering, we were born out of scripture. Last night, I thought that John Perkins was brilliant, and I told him so. In 20 minutes, I thought he shot straight toward the arrow, the center of the target with the arrow of the Word of God. He said that the Lord changed his life because of Scripture. I can tell you that the thing that got me on the path of social justice and racial healing was when I heard him preach John chapter 4. I'd never seen gender equality and ethnic diversity in a text so brilliantly presented and I studied that thing like I was studying a gold mine because it was. His love for scripture is what's informed this movement and made us who we are today. We weren't always this group of people that's big and diverse. It used to be a small group of usually people of color who could hardly pay to get to the conference. Amen. But there was a love for the word of God that marked us. Remember who you are. Remember that you were born out of suffering. Remember that you were born out of scripture. And remember that you were born out of service. The first time that I went over John and Vera May's house on the <laughs> on Navarro Street in Pasadena, California. I was a seminary student. I know I was going to meet Dr. John Perkins, so I put on a business suit. I was looking sharp. I was just sharp. Had on high heel shoes, was just cute. I was so excited to go over to his house, and when I got there, Ms. Veerman, he was in the yard digging up something and uh, uh, with overalls on, and he told me to come help him. <laughs> And I was like, nah, I'm all dressed up. I can't. And he, then he reached, we reached down in the dirt and you pulled up dirt like this and you said, Brenda, ain't nothing like being able to reach into God's good earth for yourself and touch God's soil with your own two hands. And so Miss Business Suit took off my little jacket, <laughs> went over there and tried to look like I was helping. And little did I know I was being mentored that day. The CCDA was born out of people who were not so proud not to dig in the dirt, not so proud to get a shovel or a hammer or a paintbrush or whatever else it took to show up at a gym and help kids who could never pay for the, for, for the coaching, to, to, to serve people who could never pay for the food, just to get out there and get dirty and not be ashamed to do it and to call other folks to it. That's what CCDA was based on. CCDA was based on not just the goodies. It was based on calling all of us, seminary students, those of us with PhDs, those with no D whatsoever, to say it's time to roll up your sleeves. This is not a theoretical movement. This is not a conceptual movement, though it is steeped in good theology and good conceptual thinking. It is an applicable movement. It is a practical movement. It's a get your hands dirty, get in the game movement. Remember who you are. Remember that this is the one that'll get dirt under your fingernails. That's the CCDA I'm talking about. This is the one that was born out of people who weren't afraid to invite other folks to get in the dirt. Remember that we're a movement that's indigenous, that we live in communities where people live and we respect them and we honor them and they watch us serve so long in the dirt that they start to trust us and believe us. That's who we are. Remember that we're people born out of partnership, that we don't come into communities and tell people how great it is that we've shown up with our medical stuff and our uh, 
law, law, law practices and all the other wonderful things we do to serve. We show up and we say that you are the experts in this community. You got a PhD in where you live. And we're just asking, can we live here with you? We won't try to fix things or serve from afar. We're going to come and we're going to sit at your feet and we're just going to have Bible study. And if you want to come, we welcome you. And if you watch us live this life long enough, if you watch us tell the truth long enough, if you watch us win trust long enough, maybe just maybe you'll believe that we are who we say we are. Maybe just maybe you'll come and follow the teachings that have changed our lives. Maybe just maybe if we remember who we are, you'll believe who we are and you'll give glory to God in heaven. And the kingdom of God will come on earth as it is in heaven because we are the secret agents that God plans to use to change the world. There is no other plan. There's no second choice. It's the people of God doing the work of God. And that's who we are. And my plan tonight is to simply be a Rafiki with a stick to come as hard as I can prophetically to challenge every one of us. Don't come to conferences just to show up. Don't show up just to network. For this 20th anniversary, remember who you are.